This is Winsford Cottage Hospital and it was built in the year 1899 uh, as a hospital but as the name suggests not as a kind of big massive infirmary but as a very small local facility to serve the community in the immediate area. It's properly a hospital in so far as it was built for the medical recuperation of ordinary people. And the ordinary people bit is really important because one of the things that's so fascinating about this building and which makes it stand aside from others is that not only is it architecturally very interesting, but it is one of a group of buildings that really completely transformed ordinary people's lives from a situation where you could expect to die at home in great pain from highly curable conditions to one where you could go somewhere very local and for little or no money be, be attended to by medical professionals and could get better. The whole design idea for the building was that it should be on a completely human, warm, friendly, recuperative sort of scale rather than something big and, and off-putting. We identified this building which was built to the designs of a wonderful architect called Charles Voisey, an arts and craft architect, as being a really, really special survival uh, both in terms of architecture and in terms of social history. The building's been in use as a medical facility until really recently, um, uh, only a decade or so ago it was still in medical use. So it's got all of the many layers of very kind of utilitarian adaptations that have gone on in 120 odd years of medical use. So we need to start working out how best to repair and conserve this building to sort of celebrate what's best about it architecturally and also make it work for us and for its future use. So what that involves is first of all really really careful examination of what you've got because it's very easy to think oh well that you know that thing over there doesn't seem to be important we'll rip that out and if you haven't done your thinking and your research and your analysis carefully at the beginning you can discover far too late when it's the skip's already gone that actually it was some significant early feature. The Landmark Trust has asked a team of specialists to investigate Winsford Hospital and we've been discovering how Voisey created such a warm and welcoming cottage hospital with open fires, windows which could open wide, flues for ventilation and a stunning mosaic floor which stretched from the entrance hall all the way down the main corridor. Sadly, this later had carpet glued on top of it which presents a major challenge for our conservator. The entire length of this was mosaics, as we already know, when we've peeled back bits in the past. And we've now had someone here doing a trial area uh, of picking it away to start to get to understand what the problem. the problem is. Well, and as you can see, there's going to be quite a range of problems here. Yeah. Um, clearly, the intent originally is to have a fantastic sort of shiny corridor down here but the effect of putting this uh, rubber-backed carpet on here is going to cause quite a conservation problem because we've got uh, a very fine material with a very loose, friable surface. Yeah. And unpicking one without damaging the other is going to be a very time-consuming problem. This um, cement-based latex is going to be terrible to remove because it, it's absolutely bonded. I've got, I've got a... Uh, ah, here's one. But you can just see that it is... It's not flaking, yeah, it's not picking, it's not coming mm -hmm. away at all. And presumably this screed and rubber-backed carpet have held moisture under, underneath and have made the, the uh, mosaics deteriorate. Yeah, there's two things to notice there. The first one, you can see that there's a poor plaster on both sides, like yeah. a tide line, because the non-breathable surfaces are forced to damp up the wall, damaging the plaster. So this is potentially stone and we really need to ascertain what we're going to do with it because our initial thoughts were we're going to take it back up and we, we, we were looking at areas like this and thinking to ourselves, well, yeah, we can hopefully consolidate it, get it firm and solid in its current format and then mm. put a no coating over the top. But the way this is now gone... I think at the end of the day when we've finished and got rid of all of this, it'll be a really dramatic floor finish and 
become a very sort of dominant spine and feature in the building. So we now need Lynn, a conservator, to come and have a good look. The Flotex carpet would have stopped any spills going onto the floor, but at the same time it stopped the escape of moisture. So these poor tesserae have been suffering and still actually feel quite damp. So the problems that we have are that we've got um, this area at the top of each skirting has had a, a cover strip um, which has been drilled in so we've got the screw holes to deal with. The carpet has then been put on we have a screed which from what we can tell is just down the centre at the moment but who knows what happens elsewhere um, to level the floor in part and then a very tough adhesive um, which the carpet has been stuck to and I am hoping that the screed we can chip off but peeling the carpet back a lot of the top layer, the top lamination of the um, tesserae is sticking to the adhesive and coming away with it. We have to somehow find a way to consolidate the surface such that it's a usable space and to give sort of a, a strength to the floor whether we could put a solvent down through the carpet to soften the adhesive but I mean it would be such an unpleasant process the so the you know you can't get an adhesive through just by Flotex is very design it's designed not to allow um, yeah, liquids through so it could be scored but then there's implications of damaging beneath the, the stone beneath from that so it's a probably I, Maybe, we, this is subject to change, but we might have to um, pare back and work it slowly but surely all the way back through to expose the um, stones. I think it will be a laborious and painstaking process, but hopefully we can bring back the beauty of the <laughs> voicey floor. I haven't actually sort of seen this problem before, and certainly not on this scale. It might be something that sort of other domestic houses sort of may encounter when, from the 70s but yeah to have done it to this wonderful voicey building is a tragedy. So while Lynn considers the future of the mosaic floor, John and Adrian are looking at one of the other features which makes this building so distinctive. John let's have a look at one of, one of the voicey fireplaces. A classic fireplace. It's one of the ones I, I called it the heart fireplace for obvious reasons. Um, Beautifully designed, really elegant, very, very fine mouldings here. And you can see the little fixings on the side there where it was bolted to the wall originally. And I believe it to be cast iron. And um, it seems to be in two pieces with this mm. bit joined on, which we need to investigate a bit further with. It might even be in three, presumably, because this one would have been cast separately and Indeed. put onto the top. The fineness of the moulding is very, very fine along here and just beautifully shallowly scribed into there. And very difficult to make in a cast. Really lovely. Wood. Well, if it's wood, that's got to be an incredibly mm. hard wood and a, and a very fine grained to get that crisp detail uh, all the way along. What do you think, John? It sounds like, uh, Ed, that's definitely um, a piece of metal, I'd say. It's got some green paint on it, hasn't yeah. it, on the sides there? But that would suggest that the, what you were saying earlier about how they managed to make this so fine, actually, is this top plate is screwed down, with the screws you can see here, into the shaped piece of wood, which is then fixed to the top of the fireplace. So probably this one comes in four pieces and it's a bit like the ones you can see in some of the photographs from the um, yeah I've got that photograph research. just here actually well I can't see the liner going across the middle here we got the lugs yeah on either side and the, the top piece is a distinctly different color either stained or painted presumably painted so that this piece of metal and the wood all come in as one yeah hugely interesting yeah. What's really interesting about this fireplace is it's a model for some of the other missing fireplaces in the hospital. So yeah. it's going to measure this and you can see that the well, we just, yeah, height of the fireplace 
is just about 52 inches high here. And you can see, obviously, there's a, a profile to it. And we found that on one of the other fireplaces, yeah. which is missing. So we go and check that dimension. Yep. Now let's check this dimension then on this fireplace, because we're certain this is not a voicey fireplace, no, is it? it? It's very odd and, and clearly not the original. And taking off the wallpaper here has given us a profile or an outline here which we think should match the noisy fireplace as we see elsewhere. Yeah. We've also got both sides here, bits of the skirting yeah, that being something going on chopped there, off. Mm. So if we have a look at the moment, um, the fireplace in the other room was 52 inches high, and that corresponds almost exactly with the line here just marked on the wall from our first exploration. And more, probably more importantly, this, this shadow line coming through here. And you get sort of curve on the end there, don't you? Yeah. And then, well, the, the width we measured in the last one was 33 and a bit. That's 32. So, you know, you come up to here and it, it fits exactly. So the evidence on the wall is that there would have been a Voisey fireplace here before this one was put in. And lovely as it is, I think it will be much better if we can get a proper Voisey fireplace put back here. I'm just going to apply some um, just water to moisten this area, which then shows us the variation in colour of the green tesere and how rich and beautiful the floor might have once looked when it was um, polished. Um, so far, we don't know what the tesserae are exactly, but then they have suffered a lot, so it's quite hard to tell without further analysis. They might be a travertine or something. Um, as for the green marble, I quite like the idea of it being a Cornish serpentine, but again, we need to analyse that, I don't know. <laughs> and so, unfortunately, it does seem um, rather extreme, but we're going to take a sample of a tesserae. Um, all areas, I don't want to take it where it's too damaged and you know, which it tends to be the sort of more hidden areas so it will be from the sort of main thoroughfare of the floor if you like. If it's too damaged it's not representative of the true nature of the stone because so much has happened to it so it's changed in form. You often can get information from that but ideally it's from a perfect piece of stone which will give us the sort of best, uh, most amount of information to identify. These initial investigations and research take time and involve a complete top-to-bottom examination of all the structures and materials in the building. So we need to have a look in yeah. here and see what we've got underneath. So we had a roofing slater come and have a look here today, gave his value of his wisdom, yep. uh, expert in Delabol, slate, etc. And we took apart this part and also another section of roofing further on up. Now this is a really interesting thing and uh, we revealed and it's horsehair um, and there are, well, there are different schools of thought, we're still researching in terms of what it was actually for. Um, there was this idea that it actually soaks up any water that comes through the slates and then just allows it then to breathe back out so it acts as a kind of um, it's like a barrier. moisture stop isn't yeah, it? Yeah. A moisture stop. But there's also now thought that it was there to, and it has been found on railway buildings, um, which is really curious given that we're right next to a... Howell Junction. Howell Junction. Yeah. That it was used for some sort of sound insulation and stop um, vibration and things. Chattering of the slates. Yeah. Our uh, Slater, he was very, um, oh, very surprised to see all this and, and believed that this obviously was original. So these mm. slates and this roof has been here for a over a hundred years, years now, yeah. which is a good time for a good slate yeah. roof. Um, and actually, they're, generally speaking, they're in remarkably good condition and we yeah. should be able to salvage a, a fairly high proportion of them. Yeah. There are some fairly large slates and I think some of the larger ones are on some of the other mm. pitches. There's a, certainly a very big uh, long slate there. Yeah, because they're laid in diminishing courses, but you've got these sort of 
jumpers almost, which are the, the wrong proportions. It's great to know that we can save the roof tiles and it looks like there's good news from Lynn. And here we have one of the ochre tesserae, which is in actually much better condition than we might have hoped, so that is good. And this will allow us to um, make a thin section to analyse the, um, the marble or limestone, which it is, um, which will inform the conservation processes. Lifting the tiles has given Lynn an idea. It seems that all of the decay is on the top, so um, there's a good chance that we can conserve um, an awful lot more than we might have been able to. The other option is that if they are very deteriorated, we might be able to turn them over and use the underside in the worst areas. But let's hope that we can find a solution, a conservative solution, so we're not replacing it and we can retain as much of the original material as possible and not have to introduce any as you know, minimal with our new material. The Landmark Trust is all about conserving history and giving new life to important buildings. One of the other lovely things about this building is because it was always a community building, long before that was a kind of catch, catchphrase, um, it is a building which will once again be able to be part of the lives of people in this area and more generally because as well as being somewhere that people will be able to rent for a week or a weekend for a holiday, we're also um, retaining a part of the building which will be available for um, interested parties to come and visit and see what happens here for community groups to gather and do things. It's also a building that we expect to use as part of our 50 for free scheme which is where we make buildings that we look after available completely free to charities who work with groups that really need support in one way or another and to let them come here which often involves people who are dealing with recovery from serious illness or indeed the prospects of uh, of illness. So it feels like it's an amazing opportunity with a building which has kind of well-being and, and, and recovery and recuperation in its very DNA to, to use this building in the future in a way that will help lots of people feel better, whether it's just getting away with friends or whether it's participating through one of these other programmes. It's a building we'll be able to make really accessible for visitors. So everything's on the level, the doors are lovely and wide. So in terms of people who come here with you know, um, uh, accessibility issues in a wheelchair, whatever it be, this building hopefully will again be the wonderful, welcoming, friendly, um, sort of healing space that it was designed to be. It's, it's hard to imagine it now, but of course the great thing that keeps everybody going at this stage in a project is the prospect of the day when it's all done and of what it's actually going to be like to stand here in this hall and instead of being surrounded by great huge mould patches and sort of smell of decay and the, the kind of layers of paint and the collapsing roof structure and the thought of standing here in this entrance hall designed by Voisey on this wonderful human scale absolutely the opposite to what you think of a huge impersonal hospitals as being like and to think that it can be like that again and people from far but also the local community can come and get that feeling is absolutely thrilling.